All right. Good morning, Hope Church. It's wonderful to see you all today. That's right. Is this thing on? <laughs> all right. But Jesus is here. God is here. His love is here. It is real. And let's put it into our hearts this morning as we worship. Would you please stand as we lift our voices together? One, two, three. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears It's like holy water on my skin In a world full of hate 
it realize When you do somebody wrong, make it right Oh, don't hide in the dark, you were born to shine In a world full of hate, be a light La, 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 la In a place that needs a change, make a difference Cause life is but a breeze, better live it. In a place that needs to change, make a difference. In a world full of hate, be a light. When you do somebody wrong, make it right. Oh, don't hide in the dark, you were born to shine. In a world full of hate, be a light. In a world full of hate, be a light When you do somebody wrong, be it right Oh, don't hide in the dark, you were born to shine In a world full of hate, be a light In a world full of hate, be a light When you do somebody wrong, be it right Oh, don't hide in the dark It's hard to live in color when you just see black and white In a world full of hate, be a light Would you please pray with me? Persistent God, in disbelief we thank you for never giving up on us. No matter how often we ignore you and turn away from your word, you call after us with love and mercy. When we don't like what you might be saying to us, you encourage us with love and understanding. And every time we question or doubt you, you reach out to us with warmth and mercy. Abide with us, we pray, despite all our shortcomings, and open our hearts to hear your word. Amen. You may be seated. Today's Old Testament lesson is from 1 Samuel 3, verse 1 through 21. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord of, uh, under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God was, had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. But again, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to see Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. 
Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears it about it, everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision, but Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, Here I am. What was it he said to you? Eli asked. Do not hide, from, do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I don't know if that little bit of echo that I, that I hear myself and I heard in Russ what is intended to make us sound a little more powerful, a little more gravitas, but, but I like that when you read the scripture and there's just, it's, it almost sounds like the word of God for the people of God, you know, I love, I love it. So it's funny to have a text on uh, hearing and listening uh, only because this morning at the nine o'clock service, Jack Trail was here. Do you know Jack Trail? Well, great guy. Uh, but Jack wears these giant hearing aids, which he did not have on today. And so Jack sat through the whole first service and nodded along, you know, up here in the pulpit watching him. He's nodding along, everything's going along great. And then after the service, I'm standing in the narthex, shaking people's hands, saying goodbye. And Jack walks up and he goes, I left my hearing aids at home, so I didn't hear a word you said, but it was sure good being here. And I thought... Okay, well, you know, some things you hear, some you don't. Now, most of you, well, some of you uh, will remember commercials from the 1970s. Was anyone around then, maybe? Not Annalise, not, not Eleonora, but maybe some of us, not Pam, Scott, but some of us will remember the 70s. Um, remember in the 70s there was a commercial for a brokerage firm called E.F. Hutton? Do you remember this? And my favorite is there's two gentlemen sitting in a, a restaurant, a white tablecloth place, and everyone's in suit and tie, and one's telling the other about all the, all the great things that his broker has been sharing with him. And he goes, and what is your broker saying about the market? And he says, well, my broker is E.F. Hutton. And E.F. Hutton says, and you know what happened, right? The place gets quiet, and everyone leans in to hear what E.F. Hutton said. And then you hear this disembodied voice. It sounds a little bit like Russ in that echoey kind of voice, and it says, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. So I wondered, as I was reading this text today, who do you instinctively listen to when they speak? How do others get your attention when they want you to listen? At our house, we use a starter word. I don't know if this is true in anyone else's house, but... I am driven by distraction. I'm usually trying to do three or four different things at the same time, and I'm only half listening to what's going on in the house. Because we have the TV on, radio on, sometimes two TVs on two different things, you know, and, and doing my thing, right? And Annalise is just telling me all about her day, right? And I've been hearing all about everybody's day all day. So I'm not really paying attention until she says the starter word. So... 
And when I hear so stretched out like that, I'm like, "Uh uh-oh. I missed something, and here it comes, what I should have been listening to. And I meet, everything gets put down. Yes? And then it's, I need you to, you know, pick up the kid from school, or, you know, there's, they're fill in the blank with, with, with something that needs to happen. But it begins with a starter word. And so I, I wonder, when God speaks, do we really listen? Or does maybe God need a starter word? Right? Another commercial, about 30 years after that E.F. Hutton commercial, do you know the Verizon commercials? The little dark-haired guy with the dark horn-rimmed glasses that goes around and he's constantly on his phone going, can you hear me now? Good. And then he's, you know, like out in a blizzard. Can you hear me now? Good. And then he's like in a subway, you know, can you hear me now? Good. He's in all these different places, you know, can you hear me now? Good. And it's all about Verizon signal strength, right? To let you know that if you have a Verizon phone, you're going to be able to, to hear people wherever you go. Great. I think Verizon's terrible, but that's just me. But the question comes as we read this text and think about it, how good is your signal strength when it comes to hearing from God? Do you have an open line of communication with God? Are there maybe some dead spots? Some places that you go where you can't seem to hear the voice of God? If you were to rate your service, how many bars would you say you're getting? Two, three, four? If God was trying to speak to you today in this space, do you think you would hear God say, can you hear me now? Good. See, in this passage in 1 Samuel, we're noticing there's a transition. You may not have heard it in the reading that Russ just did. But he talks about that there weren't visions. God was not speaking to the people. And then suddenly by a breaking in to talk to this boy Samuel, God begins to speak in a way that the people of Israel can hear for the first time in a long time. This is Samuel who anoints two different kings. I mean, he he becomes a pretty big deal, right? He is God's prophet. So I went looking at the text again and wondering, okay, what is it that we can learn about hearing from God as we read the text? Well, the first thing is that Samuel was still a boy when he was called by God, right? He was still a boy. Theologians, people that really know this stuff, study it and kind of understand what happened, they say, here was this Samuel who was promised to God's service by his mother, Hannah, who was not able to have a child, who said, if you'll let me have a baby, I will just dedicate that baby back to you. So they take him as a child every year to see Eli, and then at some point they give him to Eli for service in the temple. It says that this story took place when he was probably 12 years old. So what's interesting about that is that God's call is not dependent upon our age, our experience level, or our education. When God calls someone to a task, all that stuff doesn't matter. We like to think that God's only going to call prepared people. That's what Moses did. God, I can't even talk. Could you just find somebody who can talk? Because I'm not really sure I can even do this job. God doesn't always call people who are prepared. Instead, God God prepares the people that God has called. Do you get that? He calls totally unprepared people to do extraordinary things in the name of God, and God prepares them for the task. Calling is a God thing. It's how we respond that's an us thing. Calling is all about God and what God can do. It's not about us and what we can do. All we have to remember is that Samuel had a posture that was made up of two things that made it possible for him to hear God's calling. He was a servant. He had a servant's heart. He knew that he was called to be a servant in the temple. And he was willing to listen. Not everybody's like that, right? Not everyone has a servant's heart. Not everyone is willing to listen. Samuel's calling started with servanthood. He saw himself as a servant of God under Eli's leadership. But the second piece was the listening. Most of us find it hard to listen amidst the hustle and bustle of things going on. Forget my wife and her starter word. How in the world, in the midst of all of that, am I to hear Jesus speaking? How am I to hear God calling in the midst of all the two televisions on two different things on the radio and kids talking and dogs barking and all the other things that go on in life? Speak, your servant is listening. Russ read it. Speak, your servant is listening. It's not a one-liner. It's not a joke. It's describing a way of life. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. What would happen if we woke up every morning and that was our prayer? 
in the stillness of the morning after we've hit the alarm and turned it off, to just lay there in the quiet for just a moment and say, Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. What might God say into that still, quiet moment if we made room for it? If we weren't jumping to get in the shower to get the kids to school to get to work, you know? There's other lessons to learn from the reading as well. You can worship God and still not know God intimately. I don't think it says it exactly this way in the text that Russ read to us, but you have to understand Samuel slept on the floor in the temple next to the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, remember, was this big box that they carried around in the desert? And then they brought it into the temple when it was built. It was to be the very presence of God. It was a big box they put the Ten Commandments in. So if that's the presence of God, imagine that Eli sleeping in another room. Samuel is sleeping next to the presence of God night after night after night. But the text that Russ read to us says, but God had not spoken to Samuel. God had not been revealed to Samuel yet. Not until this night. So you can worship God. You can even think you're... You're serving God and still not be listening to the voice of God. Not really know Jesus. Sometimes we know a lot about Jesus, but we don't really know Jesus. Right? We can do lots of Bible studying, but until we do some Bible doing, we may not really come to know Jesus intimately. You can hear God speaking, but not recognize that it's God. Samuel went to Eli three times. You rang. No. And it took Eli a minute to catch what was going on, right? One of the other things we learn is that sometimes a mentor can help us recognize and respond to God's voice. When I was discerning my own call to ministry, I had a mentor who was assigned to me, and I would journal my prayer life and my Bible study, and I was answering these questions about discernment for a whole year, and I would keep taking this journal to this mentor who would read it and try to read past all my daily devotional kind of stuff and see what was the thread that was going through it and help me discern what was I hearing in that study and, and that time of discernment. And still, ultimately, my calling was revealed to me in the night, in a dream, actually a series of dreams, but in one night. And the great thing is that a mentor can confirm for us or can help us see, you know, whether God is or has not, in fact, been talking to us. I have mentors in the clinical pastoral education that I just began at Mercy St. Anne. So I'm at Mercy St. Anne Hospital a couple of days a week. And in that role, I have multiple mentors. I have an educator. Uh, he's a guy who spent 30 years as the chaplain at um, Children's Hospital in Dallas, Texas. I have what is called a preceptor, uh, who is the director of spiritual care at St. Anne, who supervises my daily work. There are other chaplains on staff. There are priests that serve the patients there. I'm in a cohort group of other people who are learning how to do chaplaincy. And they all inform and mentor me. The first lesson that they teach you in CPE, and maybe it's the most important lesson, uh, is that a chaplain is to first and foremost show up. Offer a ministry of presence. Sometimes that means just standing in a patient's room. And when possible, when the patient is conscious and, and can speak, it is to listen without judgment. The first reading assignment for CPE is, get this, the book is called The Lost Art of Listening. Isn't that a great title for a book? I'm listening to it as a book on tape, but never mind. <clears throat> the Lost Art of Listening. Great book. I'll loan it out when I'm finished. And then the other thing that we have to do each week is verbatims. Do you know what the word verbatim means? Word for word, right? So we have to write up these word for word accounts of conversations we've had with patients. The patient said, so I said, and then the patient said, and I asked this question, and then the patient said, and then I reflected back to them what they said, right? Back and forth and back and forth. And then you reflect on it and you, you present this to a group of people who then ask you, why did you say that? 
Why did you ask that? Why did you feel the need to help and fix? Why didn't you just reflect back, right? So you've got people who are teaching you how to listen. It's crazy. And the truth is, after a week of that, I'm exhausted. Listening, I mean really listening, is exhausting work. But listening, really listening, is healing work. It's healing for the one who has the opportunity to be heard. And it's even sometimes healing work for the one who does the listening. Over the last week, I stood in a patient's room for half an hour and listened to him tell me how he's trying to reconcile with one of his four sons that he's estranged from because he was not, as he put it, a model parent. Most of that half hour was him explaining to me what he was and what a model parent might be. But he wanted me to help strategize how he might end the estrangement with that son. And those of you who know me know I would love to give him advice. I'd love to tell him exactly what to do. The hard part was instead asking questions. Well, what do you think might be a good first step? Who else might be able to help you in this process of trying to connect with your son? What do you think he needs most to hear from you, right? That's exhausting. Because <laughs> what I want to say was, here's what you need to do. Then I sat with the woman in her early 70s who is still trying to figure out how to forgive her parents, her alcoholic, abusive parents, who are dead and gone and who she'll never reconcile with. What do you say, right? The most healing thing we can do in many situations is listen. It's the most loving thing we can do sometimes, right? Just simply listen. I think about it in my own prayer life. My own prayer life gets filled up with a lot of words. But sitting in silence, waiting for God to speak, is just as much an act of worship as trying to intercede on others' behalf. So I read this, and I wonder how this story might help me, help us love people better. One of the things that Russ read to us this morning is that God told Samuel that Eli and Eli's sons were no good. So if God told you your boss was no good, you ought to quit, right? God said, Eli is no good. And let me tell you about Eli's sons. But says to Samuel, you are to serve in this place, in this way, until it is time for you to take upon you the mantle as the priest, and then you will do the work that I've called you to. Strangely enough, if you read ahead, Samuel had problems with his own kids. But, but he was called to this thing. And it just reminds me that even when we want to give up on people, when we do want to judge them, when we've heard their story umpteen times and you know, nothing gets better. They just want to tell the same story over and over. It's easy to want to give up on them and just say, enough. But this story reminds us that we're called to be faithful regardless of all that. It reminds us that God still speaks even when no one listens. You would have expected that God could have gone to Eli, the priest, and had a conversation. Instead, the person that God could find in the still of night to talk to was a little boy. The passage endures because it speaks to the heart of all those who find themselves feeling this called thing, this calling on their lives. Not just to ordain ministry, but to all kinds of vocations. 
many of us have felt called to work we do in caring professions and health care and right all kinds of things that, that we felt like God called us to this work to work with kids in the schools to, to, to whatever but what if our calling really at the heart of it regardless of the career that we choose or the path we feel drawn to is simply in wherever we're placed to listen God still speaks if God's people will just listen. So let me repeat the question from earlier in the sermon. How good is your signal strength when it comes to hearing from God? Do you have an open line of communication? Are there dead spots? If you were to rate your communication with God, how many bars would you give it? Two? Three? Zero? If God is trying to talk to you today, do you think maybe God is saying, can you hear me now? Good. Relationships with those we care most about, our family, our co workers, and our Savior. Relationships are built on listening. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Caring God, you see the world with all its pain and suffering, and you call us to help. So we bring before you our hopes and our desires, our doubts and our concerns, and ask that you would help us to hear your call to us. Speak, O oh Lord. Your servants are listening. We pray for an end to the hunger of the world. Encourage us to assist those who don't have enough to eat each day, especially in our local community. Help us to recognize the nourishing love of Jesus, your Son, who calls us into ministry with him. We pray for an end to the violence against your children. Help us to support and protect those who experience harm and aggression in their homes or at work. Give us the courage to stand up for those who are attacked, those who are oppressed, verbally, physically, or emotionally. Help us to accept the empowering love of the Holy Spirit in your calling to us. Help us, O oh Lord, to hear your voice in the cries of the world and to affirm our faithful response to your eternal love. Speak, O oh Lord, for your servants are listening. Even as we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We pray and we listen so that God may shape our hearts to be the people he's truly called us to be, to live in his love and surround others with that very same love. One, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs>
Where there is doubt, let me lead them by faith, making known your way. day open to the mystery and the presence of you God in our world with your grace may we be ready to see the face of your son Jesus in each stranger we meet make us ready to hear your voice in the cries of those in need make us ready to share your love with all who we may encounter through you God may we thrive amen friends would you please stand as we sing about doing just so making his word known to those who need it in this world. One, two, one, two, three, four. Many a dream has died Like a tree planted by the water We never will run dry So living water flowing through God we thirst for more of you Fill our hearts and flood our souls With one desire just to know you and to make you know me Lift your name on high Shine like the sun, make darkness run and hide We know we were made for so much more than ordinary life 
subscribe. Hey, ho, 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 to know our Father's heart. Into the world we're reaching out to show them who you are. So living water flowing through, God, we thirst for more of you. Fill our hearts and flood our souls with one desire. Joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible. Joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible. Joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible. Just to know. We lift your name on high Shine like the sun Make darkness run and hide We know we were made for so much more than We were made to thrive Amen let's, let's offer to one another a blessing of hope As our benediction Say these words with me So we may know the hope that is not just for someday But for this day Here, now, in this moment that opens to us Hope not made of wishes, but of substance. Hope made of sinew and muscle and bone. Hope that has breath and a beating heart. Hope that will not keep quiet and be polite. Hope that knows how to holler when it's called for. Hope that knows how to sing when there seems to be little cause. Hope that raises us from the dead. Not someday, but this day. Every day, again and again and again. Now go and live a life that gives others hope. Amen? Amen. Have a great week. One, two. Just to know you and to make you known we lift your name on high. Shine.